Joining us is baseball aficionado, actually the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. Also, Omega Sci-Fi to the day he dies like my daddy. Let me welcome the one and only. Yes, I had to do that to you, Don. Mr. Bob Kendrick, welcome. Hey, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great to see both of you all, and thank you for having me on the show. Ah, right, listen, Um, your work, first of all, thank you. I've gone back and forth because the uh, Major League Baseball has decided to bring all of the Negro League stats into their stats. But uh, I've had this discussion with Dr. Greg Carr, and he's like, first of all, y'all can't get all of the stats. So it's still not an equal playing field. It's something. But it also, in many ways, erases the power, the, the, the um, amazing way in which Black men in baseball created a, a community around this. You know, and it also kind of tells you that Major League Baseball is better on some level. It's still through a white lens as opposed to that those guys Satchel in them and Josh in them. And they, they, they were like, I don't even know. You know what I'm saying? So let me correct me, sir. Am I wrong for feeling this no, way? No, no. I, 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 I think what you expressed was genuine concern that was shared by many after the decision and which was truly a historic decision to recognize the Negro Leagues for exactly what they were, a major league, and then to integrate the statistics into the annals of Major League Baseball history. And for me, I wasn't as overjoyed with the statistic piece of it. It's more contextual for me. You could never reduce the Negro Leagues to just statistics. But I was excited, Karen, about what I consider to be the long overdue recognition acknowledgement, and to some extent, atonement for the egregious decision to dismiss the Negro Leagues as a major league when these other leagues were being recognized, which we know was blatantly racism when that commission failed to acknowledge and recognize the Negro Leagues. Now, for those who understand our game, and, and you know, our game is a game of comparisons and statistics. Mm -hmm. So for those folks, these numbers will mean a whole lot more to them than they will to me. Uh, and it gives them something that they can finally, cause you know, the criticism always around the Negro Leagues is, well, you know, I hear you, Bob. I know you say they were good, but we don't have any numbers. We don't have any numbers to back it up. And, and that's kind of always the out. Well, now the researchers have done a really good job, but you're right, there's still other numbers out there. There'll be more numbers to be gleaned and brought into the equation because so much of this stuff was lost over time. But 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 brother Bob, a, a couple, first of all, <clears throat> shout out to brother Larry Lester, who's a saint walking among us, as far as I'm concerned. Larry Lester was the guy who put a lot of these initial num numbers together, looking through microfiche, moldy, okay. dusty stuff, and was able to put together the pieces of this infinite puzzle. Um, but the idea that we don't have the numbers somehow suggests that 1888 to 1905 numbers are accurate when you talk about Cap Anson and, and, and Ty Cobb and Walter Johnson. So we're just supposed to believe that, right? Yeah. You know, and, and that's kind of the, the nature of, you know, the white supremacist elements of this. Well, and it also kind of helps fuel the belief that one league was inferior than the other league. Yeah. And, and that just plays into what we see societally. And, and that's still the hardest thing for my visitors when they come to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum to understand that there were two professional baseball leagues operating simultaneously to one another. One, we know virtually everything about, or at least down, we got a place where we can go learn about it. Yeah. That gave the best white athlete an opportunity to showcase his world-class baseball ability. The other, the Negro Leagues just did the exact same thing for the greatest black athletes and Hispanic athletes to showcase their world-class baseball ability. The only difference between the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues outside of pigmentation was <laughs> the fact that the Major Leagues had more money. That's it. It becomes down to economics. The major and less talent. And, and less talent. And because the talent level in the Negro Leagues was as good as any league. It wouldn't take a back door or back seat to any league. But you know, they didn't have their own stadiums like the Major Leagues did. And so they didn't have, you know, their roster sizes might be a little bit smaller, but what did they do? You added this level of versatility. So you went out and found players who could play two ways. 
And, and so when we get excited about Shohei Atani with the Angels now, I, I have to stop people and say, oh, let me introduce you to Martin DeHigo. Let me introduce you to Leon Day, Hilton Smith, Ray Brown. These were legendary two-way players before we even knew they were called two-way players. They were just playing baseball. <laughs> Double duty Radcliffe. I mean, Double duty Radcliffe. Yeah, yeah. So I, what, I think if, I hadn't, if you hadn't mentioned his name, Duty would have came out of the grave and said, hey, Bob, you forgot me. <laughs> He's up here Bob, Kendrick, Bob Kendrick is here, uh, who also played baseball, had a baseball scholarship out of uh, Crawford. Crawfordville, Georgia. Where Crawford, is Crawfordville? Where is that? Crawfordville, Georgia, Karen, is 80 miles east of Atlanta, 50 miles west of Augusta, all of okay. 500 people. All right. My mom, 500. My mom is from Augusta. She used to, it, it's like 40 going west, and I never knew what that meant because I'm from Jersey. But until I went down, I was like, oh, 40 is that road that can go. Okay. All right. So you, you had a baseball scholarship. Actually, basketball um, scholarship. Basketball. Basketball scholarship. Uh-huh. And, you know, because uh, my town was too small to field a baseball team. I wow. loved baseball have ever since I was a kid, but we only had two sports at my high school. We had basketball and track. And anybody who knows me that knows, they know I don't do anything involving running if there's not a ball associated with it. So mm -hmm. running for the sake of running, oh, no. <laughs> so how did, how did you get into this space where now you are the legacy keeper? With the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, how how did that come you know about? What? I ask myself that question sometimes too. I just seemingly was in the right place at the right time. I'm I was working for the Kansas City Star in the in the Star's promotions department, which functioned as an in-house advertising agency, and I drew the assignment of promoting the museum's first ever traveling exhibition, an exhibition called Discover Greatness. This was in 1993. And that's when I learned about the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And that's when a passion was ignited in me because he is this kid that thought he know he was a baseball fan. Then I thought I knew a lot about this game. And then yeah. I very quickly realized, Karen, that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. And I was being introduced to a brand new piece of baseball and Americana. And I became really, I would, have, I would say, engrossed in it. So now I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted everybody else to feel the same way I felt. And then I started to meet the players. And, and once you started to meet these gracious individuals who they, their spirit, because I think you both would agree with me. If they had been bitter about the things that transpired in their lifetime trying to play baseball, every one of us would have said, you had every right to be bitter. But to an athlete that I ever met that called the Negro Leagues home, I never heard one of them utter a disparaging word or thing about anybody who may have tried to perpetrate something against them as they were trying to play baseball in this country. And I found that to be an amazingly endearing spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know what? I think part of the reason that they did was you could not convince them that they weren't playing yeah. the best baseball that was being played in this country. Well, yeah, everybody else thought it was in and, Major League, but they never did. And we have evidence that that was the case from the barnstorming circuits and, 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 and the records of these teams when they took on the Mickey Mantles and the, and the so on and so forth. But I, we have a very special caller. I could nerd yeah. out with, with you on this stuff all day, but I want to get to the brother. Uh, that, that DJ, that DJ online. One Love, DJ One Love from D.C. He says he's the great grandson of Josh Gibson. What? DJ yes. One Love, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, hey, I was the one who called yesterday, Sister Karen. I was talking about the uh, the trial and everything in D.C. I'm the activist, but I'm also the great grandson of Josh Gibson Sr. Uh, hey, hey, Bob, thank you uh, for the show. And once I heard it this week that they were putting it on Sirius XM, my 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 crown just lit up, brother. Um, we met. Uh, you met me and my cousin Sean, I believe, when the All Star Game was here in D.C. Uh, Sean Gibson. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, I know. I, I, and, you know, I know Sean well, and I do remember being there in D.C. for the All Star Game. That was a historic one, and and, and my first trip to Ben's Chili Bowl where they got the mural because they added yeah. Josh, exactly. They yeah. added Josh I was and there with the Johnson to the mural. Yeah, Listen, you can't yes. say yes. you can't yes. say that, Josh that Gibson's that name. I can't say Josh Gibson's name without acknowledging that, as far as I'm concerned, he is the all time home run king. 
maybe uh maybe our brother Sadaharu O oh, over in Japan. But Josh Gibson, as far as I'm concerned, is baseball's all-time home run leader. No, no, and and the beautiful thing about Josh. Josh probably would have been the all-time home run leader in the major leagues had he been given an opportunity to play. And he may have been the greatest hitter yeah. this game has ever seen. You know, yeah. We get lost in the power. And, yeah. and the power was mythical-like. Oh, but it was very real. But people lose sight that Josh was a not a good hitter, a great hitter. And, and I mean, Don, he hit everywhere he played whether it was in the Negro Leagues, whether it was against major leaguers in the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Venezuela, everywhere this man played, he lit everybody up. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Bob, Bob Kendrick, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. If we can't get to Kansas City, Missouri, can Kansas, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri come to us? Can we, can we virtually check out what's happening in the Negro Leagues yeah. Baseball Museum? Yeah, we're, we're working right now, Karen, very frantically on digital projects. We just completed one with Microsoft that gives a little bit of a virtual tour of the museum with digitizing elements. You know, the pandemic sped up the need to do more of this kind of stuff. You know, you spend so much of your time and energy trying to figure out how I can get people through those turnstiles. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, they can't come through the turnstile. So now I had to figure out how to get this stuff out to them. And, and and so yeah, we're 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 working diligently right now to continue to create digital experiences that will help bring the content of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum to life. And if people are in Kansas City, uh, what are the practices that have you changed up? You know, we didn't have to modify too much. You know, we made some changes, basically more capacity than anything else. Our experience is not a high touch environment but we put in all the necessary protocols, the extra added sanitizing and those kinds of things that, that's necessary to make sure we keep our very valued patrons and our team as safe as we possibly can. And the thing that I'm so proud of guys, over the last several weeks, we actually turned the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum into a COVID-19 vaccination clinic. Every Monday uh, for the last almost now five weeks, we have been in here vaccinating people in this community. You know, understanding that we operate in what was once a very proud, prominent African-American community. 18 and to a partner, a partner of ours, IV, who had access to the vaccine, they brought the vaccine to the community. We opened up the museum to provide it as a safe haven for them. And I hope as a place where black folks in particular would feel more comfortable coming. You know, because, you know, there's still the stigma, this distrust of the medical profession. We don't like to go. And so, number one, we needed to provide the needed access to this. But number two, we needed to do it in an environment where maybe we felt a little bit more comfortable coming to get it. And so we vaccinated over 2,000 people wow. uh, through this effort. And, and I tell you, I couldn't be more prouder of what the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is doing and the impact that it's having directly in this community, even though it's a national museum. 